Hello. The title of this piece is Fire Alarm. Curious. Next. It's noon, and I sit at a long table full of other children. Tables and tables, long tables in a huge room. The older kids go and sit in their areas, and us younger ones have our particular place. We sit on the benches with our legs swinging. The bright windows shine the light into the room. A big, heavy cafeteria lady comes up and puts a tray right in front of us. One each, she admonishes us. So we grab our hard black food and start cutting into it and talk amongst each other. Everybody's having a wonderful time as they consume their lunch. And then we take our trays and put them in the slot and go back and sit to wait until it's time to leave. One by one, everybody takes their trays and we have to wait. And of course, we're being monitored by a stern-faced proctor. We all talk and have a great time and then it's time for recess. Wonderful. Everybody gets off the bench. And it's appropriate that we put our chairs back exactly where they were and file out of the building. All of us go down the stairway and I see a little red box on the wall with a sign that says, do not touch. And I say to my friend, look at that. We could pull it. No, 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 my friend says, there's no way on earth I'm gonna pull that thing. Do not touch, do not touch. Well, I could just touch it. <laughs> I could just touch it. But when I touched it, out came the glass and all these alarms started blaring and these lights started flashing and we ran as fast as we could. Ran and ran and ran out to the playground. I ran as fast as I could to anywhere that I thought I could blend in. There's a crowd of kids playing over there. There's some other kids on a tube swing. I go and sit into a swing and I start just swinging, hoping nobody notices me. All the children are playing. They're throwing balls and they're playing basketball. I'm just swinging hoping nobody notices. And I look towards the building where the lights are flashing and people are coming out of the building. I just keep swinging. And then the mustached, large-nosed, big gutted principal comes out and asks somebody, who did it? They pointed to me and his eyes followed the pointing and his gaze fixed on me. You, come here. I stopped swinging, and I jumped off into the sand and walked slowly towards him. Up, up, past his girth, I looked up into his eyes, and he said, follow me, with his little mustache and his flaring nose. All of the lights were still flashing, and I followed the principal, slowly. Kids who were talking and playing stopped to watch the sad progression as I followed him back to the building. All the lights were still flashing and the alarm was still going. Come here, he said, and we ascended the long staircase. I still saw those lights flashing. That alarm was still going. Up, up, up the staircase we went till we came into his office. Sit down, he said. And so I sat in the large chair. My feet didn't even touch the ground. I was so little. And he sat behind his big desk and regarded me sternly. Time to phone your parents, he said. No, no, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I said. He opens up a bottom drawer and takes out a paddy whack. Should I give you a paddy whack? He said, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I said. He puts back the paddy whack. I said, I'm really, really sorry. And then he comes around to me and he says, stand up. So I stood up. Turn around. So I turned around. And he puts my head down, bends me over, and spits.
spanks me and I screamed and he spanked me again and I screamed even louder and he spanked me again and I screamed and I cried. Oh, it hurt so badly. And then he stands me up and he sits me down again. I cried. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so, so sorry. The door opens and I look from bottom to top at the figure of a fireman with his big boots and his yellow coat and his big hat. I'm sorry, I said to him. He starts to talk to me. He's speaking to me. I didn't understand what he was saying. I just kept sobbing. I had fallen to the floor and he stood me up and the mustache principal looked at me. I'm so sorry. Go on, leave, he said. The fireman patted me on my head understandingly. And I went out the door. Finally, the alarm had stopped. I saw people talking. I stepped out and saw many fire trucks, firemen looking around disgustingly. Why were we called? What was the point of this? I went down the steps. All conversation stopped. Everybody watched me come down shamefacedly. I'd been crying so much I'd spattered my clothes with my tears. I came down the steps and I looked around and I said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And the principal said, do you get it now? Do you get it? I said, yes, I do. And then he gave me a big hug. Let's get on with our topic now. I think you've seen what it is in your um, in your program. It's achieving literacy with deaf children. And it's not the achievement of literacy. It's achieving the process of deaf children's literacy. I've worked with Kathy and Tina. And there's also a fourth person who's in our group that's Jenny Singleton. And actually, my university isn't Arizona State University, it's University of Arizona. Anyway. This is the first time that I'll be sharing my research that I've done under the, the Department of Education grant on working with deaf children's literacy. We want to see if ASL literacy will help with their interactions with other people, their social skills, and their educational skills. Now, this was planned for a three-year project. <coughs> a part of the project I want to <coughs> share with you um, comes from work that Sarah, Sarah Shelley did working with hearing children, with a deaf children. She looked at their ASL proficiency and their proficiency in English writing. They wanted to see if this would, um, if there was some relationship between the two and if it would lead to better writing proficiency. The studies with other hearing children um, are quite interesting. I'd like to look at them in relation to how deaf children could learn. Part of it is their oral tradition. We want to know if hearing children's speaking abilities, storytelling abilities, are related in some way to their writing ability. If, if improving their storytelling ability will improve their writing ability. So we want to look at both the writing and speech. And of course, they did this study with children who are hearing and who already have great English competency. And they found that retelling this is a method of um, teaching children how to tell stories helped them with elaborating the stories that they told and increased their skills in storytelling. 
The measure they used to determine this was called the T-unit. It seemed to be a very good way of measuring how elaborated their stories were. If they were quite elaborated, if they were quite embellished, or and included a lot of information and techniques from English, or were more simple and plain. So I thought about using that with deaf children. We thought we could look at the same issues in the deaf community with deaf children. I thought maybe storytelling could help improve their English skills. But before we looked at their English skills, we really needed to look at the ASL skills of deaf children. And as a group, they haven't really acquired ASL yet. It's not the same situation as it is with hearing children who've already acquired English. <clears throat> And there's also different levels of, store of, of the language that we want to look at, the linguistic level, which is more of the structures of individual sentences, and the larger discourse level, which is more about the structure of the story. We looked at different groups of deaf children, deaf children who had deaf parents, deaf children who have hearing parents, that have no sign language at home. Their parents don't know sign language and there's no sign in their environment. Now we know that that's 90% of all the deaf children. And, but we still haven't established any kind of sign language services, remedial sign language services for that group of children who don't have ASL yet. They don't, they don't use discourse in their everyday life. They don't use ASL in any kind of extended discourse. Discourse enables children to learn language. So we would think that if they learned, if we worked on their ASL discourse, that it also would improve their linguistic skills. So we had three sets of questions. One question about the feasibility of this pos of hearing, deaf children of hearing parents learning ASL. The second part of our, our study looked at how we could provide these services that would increase their ability in ASL. And the third was effectiveness. What, hap what was the results? Did, these work did it work out to help the deaf children learn ASL better? So that was our, our project and our plan. But then we had to find a site that we could use to study children. And it seemed that the Arizona School for the Deaf and Blind was near enough to us that it was um, a, um, feasible to work there. So we planned on a three-year project. Unfortunately, after the second year, the project was dropped. So we haven't gotten, we didn't get to finish the study, but we did get data from the second year that we're able to analyze. and and um, tell you the results of today. At that time, the school hadn't had any kind of program or plan for working with children in this way, and so we had to start the program ourselves. And we started a program called ASL ESL, which was American Sign Language and English as a Second Language Program. And with those support services, we hoped that we would increase children's ability to use ASL. We focused on children in elementary school in two groups. Um, one in the, the kids in the first class were in first, second, third grade, and those children in the second class were fifth, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. They um, were ranging from ages of six to 11, and um, there were multicultural and Native Americans, Blacks, Hispanics, African Americans. We had, out of the 22 children we were able to use, we, we were studied 15 of them because 20, the other children had other types of disabilities as well. We had, we divided the nine children in the 15 children into three groups. Today I'm only going to talk about nine of them. Um, and there will be three children in each of the three groups. The three groups are deaf children, 
of deaf parents, deaf children of hearing parents who sign, and deaf children of hearing parents who don't sign. So we're going to be comparing each of those groups and also each individual child within the group. Um, now I think we're ready for the overhead, Kathy. <coughs> Actually, um, We had to think about how to study deaf children and their signing abilities. And we decided that we would look at different interactions they had. So first we wanted to see how they interacted with children who were like them. So we took children who had the same background, if they were deaf parents. We had a child who had deaf parents, and we videotaped their interaction. Second elicitation was um, what we called retelling. And in this... Um, this um, situation, we had the child watch a movie from the ASL test battery that is the story of the rabbit and the turtle race. And we asked the children to watch that and videotaped their retelling of the story. And then the third one, third session, we interviewed them. An adult would interview them, and we used that. So all three of these interactions were videotaped and we analyzed those videotapes for their s storytelling and sign language ability. And oh now we're going to tell you what what the data was that we looked for. This just shows a portion of what we looked at. The next overhead shows the rest of it. You might wonder why we chose these these structures to look at. Actually, we looked at the literature that of, of the linguistics of ASL that has been done, and we found eight different groups, features, eight, eight different groups of structures we wanted to look at, and then features under each of the groups. So you can see under sign utterance, there are three different features we looked at. Single sign production, production of 10 signs, two sign production. So you can see that each group was divided up like that. <coughs> the order that we, we arranged this was in the order that, little, that deaf children learn the structures of sign language, starting with single sentences all the way to more complex constructions like classifiers and so on, which would appear later on in their acquisition. Now the three groups at the end that you see on the overhead are those, the ones that I talked about before, deaf children of deaf parents, then the second group is deaf children who sign, and the third, deaf children of hearing parents who don't sign. Then we looked at the child's videotape to see if a certain feature appeared in the videotape at any point. And then we recorded that, that they had learned that feature. There were mistakes, and we recorded the errors in another place, but I'm not going to be talking about that today. Now, and these are the seventh and eighth categories that we looked at. And you can see also that there's another column here for spring. The children um, were involved with this program both the first and second year, and we wanted to test at the beginning of the second year and fall what they knew and then retest them again in spring. So there's a pretest and a post test that we have so we can compare their abilities at the two points in time. Really, the numbers are very rough that we have here. There are eight structures that appear, so we want to know if all eight show up, and we also want to know if all of the individual features also show up, and there are, there are 24, 24 features that they could learn. 24 categories and features together. It seemed like the deaf 
children who learned sign language at home from their hearing parents and well, from their parents, and it didn't matter if they were hearing or deaf, the parents were hearing or deaf, all came out with the same results in the beginning at the pretest, but not the children who didn't have hearing parents, whose hearing parents didn't sign. However, at the post test, they were all equal again. So it seems they they reached the maximum um, proficiency that the test studied just on structures, just on the number of structures they had. So it seems like maybe they have acquired the language and they've all acquired it at the same level, perhaps. We have to look at that. So what is the problem with this? Hmm. So this seems to say that deaf children after this program are all fine. They're all at the same level of ability and the ESL curriculum is ready to start now. They've already learned ASL and now they're ready to start on English, but actually that's not what happened. There's a difference between linguistic structure, acquiring linguistic structure, and acquiring discourse. Now we have to look at what they acquired and what discourse level they acquired. And actually I found that they still had not achieved um, proficiency in that. We thought that the deaf children who had deaf parents had, were completely competent, but they weren't yet. We can, when we look at discourse, we'll be able to see that. Anyway, this seems to be a good result so far. You might want to know exactly what the project was that we that we had, what helped the children learn this kind of language, and Tina's going to talk to us about that now. physically looks like. It has four walls. And the activities that are included in that lab, what do they what might they look like? Well, we play games. The game the purpose of the games is to expand their language usage. For example, they might um, learn the learn the rules of turn taking or the importance of eye contact. Or they'll learn how to take turns. Those are important um, aspects of the games. A second activity <clears throat> might be a Disney movie, for example, like The Lion King or Cinderella. Those movies are good for children to sit and watch and to get and to receive stimulation, language stimulation from. As the ASL specialist, I do like a, a sign over for the uh, for the cartoon, and I explain to the children what's been going on in, on the videotape in the Disney movie. And the third activity that happens in the lab <coughs> is um, the third activity in the lab are signed stories. For example, some of the stories are original stories in ASL that have been created in ASL and told in ASL. And then another group are stories that are translated from English into ASL. So those are the two types of stories, the different videotapes that we've collected and have in the lab. <clears throat> the videotapes, um, you might want to know what they look like. So uh, these are, there's a videotape that's called Four For You. If you can see, Four For You videotape has four volumes in it. The videotapes in Four For You are divided into two categories, fables, storytelling, role-playing, and fairy, tell, fairy tales, storytelling. The one on the left, fables, has two parts. Some are storytelling, and the others 
involve role playing. There are two. Each story has two different components to it. And then underneath you can see the list, the names of the stories that are included. They tend to be very short stories. They're very good for children who have limited attention span or limited ASL proficiency. <clears throat> they tend to be uh, the children from the hearing parents with no signs. The uh, column on the right, there are only stories. The fairy tales, they're only stories. You can see the names of the stories listed here. These tend to be about 15 minutes in length. They're good for children who have already acquired language and are ready for more in-depth analysis of ASL. And that's what uh, storytelling is. <coughs> OK. Um, we are emphasizing the concept of retelling for the, uh, the importance of language expansion. We use the retelling process in ASL, acquis or ASL acquisition and also discourse development. And this is the process. All this entire process is, is good for normal deaf children, like the deaf children of deaf parents who have already acquired um, going through the process. This is, this is how normal children would go through the process. Now, <clears throat> if we look in the lab, what might that process look like in the lab when we focus it on a specific group for, of students? You can see the black heading at the top of the overhead. The videotape viewing. I might pick one story. It's the same story we use throughout the entire process. We don't use different stories. We only pick one videotape and use it throughout the whole process. So I'll pick a story, and the children will watch the videotape. They'll watch the, through beginning to the end. And then when we're done, <clears throat> we do an analysis of the context and the production of the signs that we used on the videotape. For example, what do we mean by a particular sentence? And what um, I might say, for example, in the bear and the bee, the bee comes and stings the bear on the nose. And the bear's nose, um, they use a sign such as uh, this uh, pulsating on the nose. And I ask the kids, what does that mean? And they have to tell me, oh, the bear hurt his nose. So we analyze the very specific signs that are used. And we go through the videotape, and we pause it, and we discuss at it, discuss the videotape, and we do a little bit more, and then we stop it and discuss the content again. And then we go back and repeat. We do a repeated viewing. And now we're into the pink box. So the first um, activity is that we repeat the viewing. We look at it all over again from beginning to end. <clears throat> and then we're ready to do role playing. The children assume the different characters in the story and, and act out the story. But, however, there is a problem. If what happens if the kids don't know how to role play? So I, as an ASL uh, language model, uh, as an ASL specialist, I jump in and, t and model for them role playing. So I act out the stories. So there is this added step in there for when students don't know how to do role playing. <coughs> I have a videotape that has various clips in it, and um, you know, if something breaks down in the storytelling, I'll jump in and help them out. And if it, you know, as long as it's going okay, they're fine. So let me show you um, a videotape of this of this portion of the process.
there's a question from the audience here. Um, that's the lab that, uh, and those were uh, deaf children. Okay, now you can see on my uh, uh, procedure here, there's a little arrow. <coughs> if we need to repeat the videotaping, the children will watch the videotaping again, or we can go back and have the children do the role playing again. That's what you were just seeing them do. They were doing the repeated role playing. And now they're ready to go to step two, or procedure two. It's the same story we're using, and the children <clears throat> are each videotaped telling the story. Then, we evaluate the retelling of the story as a group. The children all sit around, and I'm there to facilitate and discuss, and I might say, oh, you missed some information, or you missed an important part, or maybe the sequences were out of order. And so we'll sit around and we'll discuss those. It, the, the, it, it's not a critique, really, but it's a way to help, uh, help the students facilitate their learning and expand their language. And then we look at the movie again. <clears throat> then we do the retelling again, and we go back and do the retelling. I'm involved in this as well, and I videotape just like the students are. And then we repeat the retelling. We don't need to, the videotaping. We might do it individually. We might take turns. And again, we might have problems again. So then I'll stick my videotape in, for example. So again, I might be talking with the, the children and, and um, maybe something isn't particularly clear in the discussion or, so then we look at my videotape, my model of the retelling of the story and then we talk about that. So either we may watch the videotape again or we may go back and watch the original story again. <clears throat> and then we do the retelling part. Then individual students tell their stories, each take turns telling their stories, and then if it's all a success, then we get to go all the way back to the top again, back up to the black box, and we're ready for a new story. The old one's all done, and then we go all through the, both procedures all over again. For students who have limited ASL, they really start to acquire a great deal of language development, and then they're ready to go back to the classroom and join with their own class. Ready to, join, ready to join with the children of deaf parents. So when they join their classes, um, we have removed the, the, the language model now, okay? <clears throat> that classroom, in the classroom, the teacher is responsible for the, for the third procedure. It's the same process all over again. Procedure one, procedure two, and now we've added procedure three. The story structure analysis. It's a more detailed analysis of what's going on. More sequence, more discussion of the sequence, more discussion of the analysis, um, more discussion of the characters that are involved, how they respond, how they act, um, what's included, what are the outcomes, so that there's much more an analysis of what's going on in the story and a much more detailed dis uh, discussion among the children. <clears throat> then we do a retelling again. In individual students, we videotape all of the students retelling the story one more time. Then there's an evaluation based on the story structure. How detailed was it? Um, and then we look at the videotape. Maybe it, you didn't show the feeling correctly or the uh, character's response wasn't done correctly. So then the students go back and practice it some more. And then once again, there's a retelling of the individual students telling the story. And if it's successful, if the loop is successful, then we get to go all the way back to the beginning again <clears throat> and select another story and go through procedure one, two, three, all over again without the language model. Now, in the lab, when we look at procedures one and two, are they successful for, for children? Kathy Freshenot now will talk about the results of her study to find out if, in fact, Procedure 1 and 2 are successful for students.
Okay, Sam just talked about the results of his project, looking at the the rabbit and turtle story. I'm going to also look at the story, but I also want to discuss some more in depth. I'm going to look at the individual children, then at the children as groups, and then I'm going to look at um, and you notice that he talked about the fact that we had three different elicitation um, situations, and I'm only going to be looking at the second one and do a close study of an analysis of their s storytelling in that. The second one was the um, rabbit turtle story elicitation. So I'm going to look at the, I looked at all of the stories. We, we had the children look at the entire story and then ask them, to retell it. I then transcribed their story in glosses following the system that VISTA curriculum uses. The transcription was an exact record of what the child signed. And when I did my, and I used it to do my analysis. When I did my analysis, I I measured it in T units, which um, studies the elaboration of the sentence and the complexity of the structures that the children use. This measures different structures that ASL uses. And I tried to use T units in the same way that people who've studied spoken language in English have, but I needed to change it in some way to fit ASL structure. In English, people study entire sentences and consider that the T unit in English. They'll look at a clause. They'll look at the noun phrase and the verb phrase of the sentence and not the entire sentence, but just at the phrasal levels. Noun phrase and verb phrase levels. So we looked at classifiers, frozen signs, and so on. That was in the first group. The reason I have this one X is because we want to be able to give weighted, a weighted system so that more complex um, structures in ASL would be given more weight and children who had those structures would get more credits for having that as opposed to having the more simplistic structures. So we have, I have this categorized by complexity of the structure. Frozen signs, you might want to know the difference between classifiers and frozen signs. Well, this would be a classifier for run, and this is the frozen sign to run. This, classif this classifier um, would be separately coded the children would be coded, would have their classifiers on frozen signs separately coded. When I talk about roll shifts, um, we're talking about the movement of the shoulders and the body and the eyes to represent different characters. Um, verb agreement would be the movement of a sign to show noun, um, subject, object relationships, verbs of motion. Um, and then noun verb pairs should be the difference between signs like sit and chair that differ in movement. Um, aspect and number talk about um, inflections on verbs and non-manual markers would be like eyebrow raising and so on that, that mark clauses in ASL. So then we have 
an analysis of how many features the child uses and how many two units. And two units, in, when studying English and children's abilities in English, people look at sentences, but we're not really sure exactly what the sentence structure is of ASL. I mean, the individual sentences are of ASL, so instead we've, we've used a different criteria for deciding what a T-unit is in ASL. So we have two basic criteria, and criteria, one based on the noun phrase and one based on the verb phrase. That includes nouns, didactic, pointing, and rule shifting. Then on segmentation for verb phrases, they're based on verbs, on the conjunctions, then, and, but, and finish. So I use those cr criterion to separate T units in, a, in an utterance. There are actually um, several m more. I could show how I used each of these features to determine T units, but instead I'm just going to show how I used nouns to determine the units. Now I'm going to show you what one of the, this is an example of what one of the children signed. Okay. So then I, if this, I see the sign rabbit, which is a noun, then I segment the T unit there. Then I see the sign hair, that's also done. I segment the sign there. And this is a measure of the complexity of the utterance. There's an entire story to this, but I just wanted to show you one bit of, of retelling of the story of a certain segment. So I'm just taking out this one segment here where the, tur the rabbit is asleep and the turtle passes by. And I have examples of the signing of a child who had deaf parents, a child who had hearing parents with sign at home, and a child whose hearing parents didn't sign. Um, and I'm going to be comparing the child who had deaf parents with the child who had hearing parents who did not sign. You can see the comparison of how much was how many features per T unit each child sign. And if we compare them, we see that the child who had deaf parents had 5.40 features per T unit, and the child of, who had hearing parents who didn't sign had 3.67. So we see that the child who had deaf parents is a much more elaborated system. Okay, now these are studies of individual children. First, group, first child had deaf parents, the second child had hearing parents who signed, the third child who had hearing parents who didn't sign. Now, we've, on the x-axis you see fall and spring as the two labels. Fall represents the pretest that we gave the children at the beginning of the year, and then after their experience in the lab and in the program, we gave them a protest in the spring, and those are the two um, points in time that we tested. It's quite interesting to look at the difference, because you see that in the beginning there was a great uh, variance between the three children in the fall. However, this is much smaller in the spring. In the fall, the, the child who had hearing parents had about 2.5, and the child with deaf parents had about 6.5. But in the spring, you see that that changes, and that the child who had hearing parents who didn't sign increased quite a bit, almost, and seems to be trying to catch up with the children, children who have signing parents. So I 
performed a lot of statistics on these um, data and analyzed them, divided the children into three groups, A, B, and C. Those are the children who have deaf parents, the children who have hearing parents who sign, and the children who have deaf parents who don't sign, and they separated them individually. And we see in the beginning that two of the students have two point something. But in the spring, one s student who started with a two point something became as proficient as the students who had deaf parents and kind of joined their group. When we look at the children C1 and C3, we see they also improved, but not quite as much. They, they became as proficient as the children who were in group B during the fall. Now we look at B2. We see one of the children became as proficient as the, deaf, the children who had deaf parents. But B1 and B3 seemed not to improve that much. They did improve, yes. But they didn't, they didn't um, become more proficient than the, than the children in their own group and didn't move into the next group. But when I looked at their experience, I realized that the first child had only one and a half years of experience in our program, and the second child only one year. She'd been very new to the program. And so it seems like... Um, that they needed more time in the program in order to um, fully, acquire. fully acquire the um, language. And you see the children who had stars by the name had the full two years experience. And we look at the children who had deaf parents and we see that they had, that by the springtime they had 8.62, 6.95, as their score, and I wondered if maybe that means that they had achieved proficiency in ASL. So to test this, I looked at a professional storyteller and did the same sort of analysis on that professional storyteller that I did on the children. I used the same rabbit turtle story as well. And he averaged 9.50 <coughs> features per T unit compared to the best child who had deaf parents, which was 8.62, and he was still much more proficient than the, deaf, the children of deaf parents. Okay, Sam? So, in <laughs> summary, what does this mean? It means that there are uh, various layers, and, and students can move through the, those layers in language acquisition. It means that the lab helps them with language acquisition. However, not necessarily with storytelling. <clears throat> we, we can discuss the techniques and what those look like and provide the support systems for that. But, uh, but it, it's... Um, The level of a language acquisition that students experience really does depend on the level of time that they're involved with the program itself. <coughs> Remember, the goal is to have them all at the same level, but um, if the mother and father are deaf, they have more time to progress. 90% of the students have hearing students and 10% have deaf. And the idea is to get them all to 100%. That is the goal, to get them all to the same language level. But it, does that mean that, um, that, that, uh, that, it's, that the language acquisition is complete? No. They need to continue the process in the classroom. They need to make the transfer from the activities in the lab into the classroom. So in summary, remember in the beginning we talked about our question, the feasibility issue. So uh, deaf children of deaf parents, yes, it seems that they can learn ASL. Deaf children of hearing parents can learn ASL. 
And what might that program look like? The sign language services that are needed. The third aspect was the effectiveness. Yes, that we've seen students that can jump between groups, that they were able to proceed, progress upward in their language development. But we need to have more time to see the, the actual final result, results. It's unfortunate that the program was closed. <clears throat> and also, we looked at um, deaf children of hearing parents only. We didn't look at, we didn't do the comparison of deaf children of deaf parents. We wanted to do deaf children of deaf parents going through this program, but we still have not done that yet. We need to set that up this year, and the program had been closed. We, need, uh, we needed to take that group all the way through this. Um, there, was no there was no support through the program. The teacher had not gone through the entire progress, pro process. The teachers didn't support the program, only the superintendent did. So we have to keep sign language. So um, the sign language services aren't enough. We need to continue deaf education.